Good morning, everyone. We'll give it a, a couple minutes for everyone to get uh, logged in and join us, um, and then we'll get started. Okay, Lynn, I would take it away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Boots on the Ground, a masterclass in sustainable viticulture and Lodi rules. I'm Lynn Fletcher. I'm with SOM Foundation. We provide enrichment opportunities and over $150,000 in scholarship funds to beverage professionals every year. We're thrilled to be part of this event. We'd like to thank Elaine Brown, all of our panelists, and the Lodi Wine Grape Commission for making this event possible. Uh, the Lodi Wine Grape Commission is a trade association that represents 750 wineries and, uh, or excuse me, wine growers and 85 wineries. And they have very generously sponsored a scholarship competition for all of you. So um, at the end of this, the webinar today, we're going to be sending out uh, an email with a link to a competition test. And the top three scorers of that competition are going to receive scholarships. Uh, third place will receive $500, second place will receive 750, and first place winner will get a $1,000 scholarship. All three of those winners will also receive one year's access to SOM Foundation's SOM Geo. Uh, so keep an eye out for that email. It will have a link to the test included in it. The test is only available from 6.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. tomorrow Pacific time. That is the only time you'll be able to take the test, so make sure you log in during that window. Um, the test is comprised of 42 multiple choice and true-false questions, and whoever the top three scorers will receive the scholarship funds. If there is a tie, the faster time will determine the winner. You must have attended the class today to be eligible for the scholarship fund. So make sure you stay logged in through the end. And anyone associated with the Lodi Wine Grape Commission is welcome to participate in the test, but you are not eligible for scholarship awards. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Stuart Spencer, the Executive Director of the Lodi Wine Grape Commission. Enjoy. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I want to thank you and, and all the team at the Psalm Foundation for helping make this um, seminar possible this morning and uh, our partnership we've had for the past couple of years uh, working with you uh, and the Psalm Foundation and helping um, uh, educate people about Lodi and all the unique things we have to offer. Uh, I'm really excited about today's program. I think we've got an incredible panel of speakers and, uh, and, and moderator in Elaine. Um, the Lodi Wine Grape Commission is celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Lodi has a long history of growing grapes going back to the uh, mid 1800s, um, but our organization has been around for, for the last 30 years. And um, one of the programs we really kicked off um, right after we got started was back in 1992, we launched our first integrated pest management program. And that program started out, out in the vineyards, you know, introducing integrated pest management practices and has evolved over 30 years into our Lodi Rules for Sustainable Wine Growing Certification Program. It truly is a program that grew from the ground up in a grassroots effort, and I think that's what really makes it special. And today, we're going to use it as a lens to look through and, and learn about Lodi, and uh, we're going to do it from in the vineyard. I mean, we're going to have four incredible growers that are going to be sharing their experiences, and, uh, and we're gonna be uh, led through this discussion by um, Elaine Shukin Brown. Um, I've known Elaine now, I think going on eight, nine years, and I've never come across anyone that has shown as much interest in Lodi from the, the wine media and trade world. She's an incredible speaker, writer, and illustrator around the subject of wine. And we are delighted to be partnering with Elaine on this program. Let me quickly introduce our panelists. Um, and, and share with you there a little bit about them and, and what they bring to the table. Uh, first, we have Madeline Kolber, who is uh, one of our multi-generational farming families who does a fantastic job of making her husband look really good. And, 
and she runs the Lodi Rules Certification Program for, for um, KG Vineyard Management and a, an expert on, on this program and her farming operations. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Aaron Lang. Aaron uh, joins us from Lang Twins um, Family Vineyards and Winery, and uh, Aaron is also very passionate about farming and, uh, and growing up in the vineyards and, and having to work for free planting um, cover crops and, and beneficial plants on the weekends. Um, his parents made him learn early on the value of those things. Uh, third, I'd like to introduce Phil Abba. Phil is one of our, our smaller growers here in Lodi and farms some incredible vineyards over um, off Dustin Road in the Lodi area. And uh, Phil grew up in a family farming operation that I think has been um, been there almost 100 years now. And so Phil will be sharing some of his, his wines from his vineyards and, uh, and telling his story. And then lastly, we are joined, joined by Kevin Phillips of Michael David Vineyards. Um, we're not exactly sure what Kevin's title is there, but we do know he oversees a lot of their production operations and their vineyard operations. And I think Michael, David, and Kevin deserve a lot of credit with the Lodi Rules Program. Um, they were one of the first, actually they were the first to offer a financial incentive for growers to get certified that really helped kickstart the program and, uh, and got a lot of growers in it. And Kevin has been a, a very much a leader in that program. So without anything more from me, I'm gonna turn it over to Elaine and, uh, and our panelists to lead you through uh, the, the Taste of Lodi today. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you to Lynn and Psalm Foundation for um, partnering with um, Lodi to help make this event happen. I'm excited about the scholarship opportunity that Lodi has offered. It's, um, it's so timely right now too. There's really an increased interest in education in wine overall. And so it's great to see that effort happening. Um, just in terms of webinar basics, I'd like to remind everyone that we're happy to see people joining chat. Do make sure that on the to field where you type in your message that you have selected um, everyone or um, on some screens, it'll say panelists and attendees. And that gives you gives um, the other people watching the webinar the ability to see what you're commenting as well. If you have a question for the panel, please go ahead and um, you, if you scroll over your window, you can see there's a Q&A option. So if you click on that, you can type your questions directly into the Q&A box. And that makes it a little bit easier for me to keep track of, of questions. We also have um, Dr. Stephanie Bolton in the audience and she's gonna be helping answer questions um, through chat and Q&A as well. So it's a huge honor to have her here with us. What, um, as Stuart mentioned though, what we would like to do today is really bring attention to farming and to growers because the truth is that you know, we hear, and we hear this in wine all the time that quality starts in the vineyard, the wine comes from the vineyard. And yet at the same time, a lot of um, the general public, uh, wine trade and wine media don't really know much of anything about farming. And so we all got together and decided, you know what, why don't we just create a session that really focuses on the realities of farming and the practical sides of farming because that's also gonna help all of us better understand why um, different sustainability programs would matter and how to understand the differences between them as well. So just to comment for a few minutes to give us a general framework, what we're gonna do today is we are gonna use four wines as touchstones for a broader conversation, but each of them is going to be a kind of window into looking at specific farming practices and different parts of Lodi as well. And the reason that doing it in this way where we look at different areas and um, different growing conditions through four different wines matters is because one of the most succinct, easy ways to think about what sustainable farming really amounts to is to think of sustainability as farming with long-term vision in a range of conditions and circumstances. So the idea, again, what, what really, um, the basis of sustainable growing, regardless of a certification program, just the idea of sustainability, again, is that point that we're farming with long-term vision, we're farming over time. The idea is to sustain our resources and, to, and improve the quality of our wine growing for the sake of future generations. So that's where the long-term vision part comes in. But the other crucial piece to remember with farming is that there's never one practice that best suits every place. 
sometimes in the wine trade and wine media, we get in the habit of asking specific questions, assuming that yes or no is always the right answer, as if one thing is, is the, key, um, the key piece to determining quality or best practices. But the reality of farming is that there's always a complex range of conditions and decisions that must be made. And so that's why I say we have to always remember that sustainable wine growing and sustainable farming in general brings together that sense of long-term vision in, into a range of, of conditions and circumstances. Now, sometimes too, when looking at different articles that come out about sustainability in relation to wine, I often see a mistake that happens in these articles where people will make the claim, oh, but there's no clear definition of sustainability. In actuality, um, there is a clear definition of, sustainability, definition of sustainability, and that is a bringing together the three elements that must all be respected um, in order for farming practices to be done in a sustainable way with that long-term vision. And that is very simply people, place, and prosperity. The point of, the, of those three things is that we must be caring for our communities and the health, not just of our vineyard workers, but of all people that are connected to the community um, where the vineyards are located. That's the people part. The place is obviously, as we were already mentioning, farming to the conditions of the specific vineyard, but also its surroundings. We have to remember that sustainability is not just about vines, it's about the holistic environment in which the vineyard uh, is situated. And the prosperity piece comes in because it is literally impossible to perform what we would idealistically see as the very best farming practices if they are not economically feasible. And so we must always be bringing together those three things, people, place, and prosperity to be farming sustainability. The key difference between a sustainability program and something like organic or biodynamic certification is that three-part um, harmony. Organic and biodynamic uh, certification programs have similar goals in the sense of wine quality, but it is only in sustainability certification programs that you add the people element and the economic element. And so that's what's really crucial to understand in thinking about um, sustainable certification. So what we're going to do today is like really talk through the realities of how to do this well, um, how it factors into wine quality, and specifically how Lodi Rules um, manages these things. Uh, we'll get into details as we go, but the really the, the crucial piece I want to emphasize with Lodi Rules specifically is again that thing that I already said, that it's, it is a comprehensive program that deals not just with farming in terms of vines, but also the holistic environment in which the vineyard is situated, the health of the people and the community as a whole, and the economic feasibility through, through businesses, uh, business um, plan and, and um, cost as well. And so the other thing that makes Lodi Rules really significant is that it is the longest standing original sustainability program in um, North America. Um, as Stuart mentioned, the first iteration of it actually got started in 1992 and continued to evolve over time um, into the full, what is now known as the full Lodi Rules program, which um, became known as Lodi Rules in 2005. So this program got started in the early 1990s. Um, it has become the inspiration and basis for programs around the world. Um, and, and what really is significant about it is that it was literally the first comprehensive and third party audited uh, program in the United States. Um, so again, that piece about third party auditing is really crucial in that um, what that means is there, there must be a transparency of farming practices that are being vetted by an outside group who is, um, who is neutral essentially, who is just there to make sure that, that things are being done accurately and um, in alignment with, with the overall program. Now, Erin, you've actually been part of helping to evolve the Lodi rules practices over time. So I wanna check with you, is there, are there any other basics? Obviously we're gonna get into details as we go, but are there any other basics about the program that we should add there? 
I mean, I just commented, I thought this was uh, one of the best introductions that I've ever heard in the program. Um, but I, the only thing that I thought that maybe you could include is the accreditation piece. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Lodi Rules Certification Program and the Sustainable Wine Growing Program, those rules were actually um, certified, accredited by an eco labeler. And in this case, that eco labeler is uh, Protected Harvest, which is the organization of academics, um, environmentalists, uh, and other professionals who reviewed the uh, the standards that the Lodi Wine uh, Lodi Rules Committee created, and actually uh, vetted them to see if they met certain criteria to actually be deemed sustainable wine growing, sustainable farming. And so, not only is it a third party entity which um, audits, but it also is an entity which accredited those standards and checked them to that they meet cert certain sustainability um, uh, thresholds. So, I think that's really the only. Uh, part of it that I would say that uh, needed to be added. Well, and Aaron, I know one of the things you and I have spoken about too is, is the point that really what Lodi Rules offers growers is a toolkit, mm. but that, that toolkit is based on current science so that growers can be actually like tracking, assessing, and, and honing their practices, but based on best science practices. So without having to go out and like learn all the current studies, they're actually receiving yeah. a workbook that gives them tools to make decisions for themselves. No, it's it's pretty incredible program because uh, as the Lodi rules, as you know, was based on the uh, wine growers workbook, which is I, I was part of the second edition uh, in creating that workbook. And we had um, actually one of the most foremost viticulturalists in California, Nick Kuzlian, who was just like one of the, the gods and legends of California viticulture, uh, basically said, hey, when you guys do the third edition, this is basically going to be the textbook for every major viticultural program in the nation. Um, and so that tells you how much value that information has. Um, and remember, um, the certification program is just a way for us as growers to communicate with credibility and with integrity to the consumers who want to know a little bit more about our growing practices that we follow, which originated in the Sustainable Wine Growers Workbook. The certification program is just a way to provide teeth to make sure that we are meeting those standards and also to provide the transparency and credibility uh, of, our, of our actions to the consumers so they know that when they pick up a bottle of Lodi Rules wine, that they know it was grown with standards that they can see and understand uh, from uh, our growing perspective. Right, and so one of the things, we'll look at the, the decals um, later as well, but some of you have some wines with you. And if you look at the back, there is actually a, a decal. Um, again, we'll look at a slide later that, sh that gives a better image of it. But the decal on the back is what Aaron is referring to as well. That sh indicates to consumers that that 85% or more of the grapes that go into that particular wine have gone through this auditing system and, and been certified. But um, I want to make up that point about the toolkit before we keep going. And, you know, because again, the, you know, something that is important to understand is that sustainability programs in general share a common goal, which is to balance people, place, and prosperity in a way that improves wine quality, right? So again, that sense of long-term vision, farming to a particular context for the sake of improving quality. So this is really not about trying to compete sustainability programs against each other. They share that common goal, but this is about understanding what, what does make Lodi rules different. And in my mind, the really crucial piece to understand is that Lodi rules provides a toolkit that allows growers to better understand their own farming and make best decisions for themselves in their own context. And that really is different from how other programs are, are um, situated. But Phil, when you actually had a previous um, career as, as a firefighter and then came back to farm family vineyards in Lodi, and you and I have spoken a few times about how joining Lodi Rules really helped get make clearer for you. You grew up in a multi-generational family, multi-generational farming family, as Stuart mentioned, so really grew up already around farming and farming with your family, your um, father, uncle, grand and grandparents. But even so, you commented on how that toolkit from Lodi Rules really helped improve you as a grower. Could you comment on that just briefly? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I am definitely a newbie to this uh, Lodi Rules. Uh, I'm coming up on six years where 
All the other panelists have been doing it much longer than that. So um, coming back and taking over the family farm and the management and not being a part of that before uh, in a day-to-day -day, you know, world, um, I definitely have learned a lot from Lodi Rules. Um, it has helped me in a lot of areas, especially soil management, water management, um, but the overall program is just an amazing program, I think, and has helped our family and our vineyards to, to really move forward and just um, to get better every year. We try to, to, to improve every year. And this, uh, as far as, you know, uh, sustainability. And, and uh, I think this program has just really helped us move forward as a farming operation. Great. Well, and we'll talk um, more in a little bit about uh, specific examples too, but let's go ahead and start um, looking at wines. We're going to start um, with a clinker brick 2020 Grenache Blanc. But in order to do that, Jenny, if we could go ahead and pull up the um, the large California map and we'll just situate everybody to make sure people understand where Lodi is located. And then we'll look at the wine specifically. So this is a really great general map. You can see X marks the spot. Lodi is um, located there um, um, where the X is on this particular map. But if we go into the next um, broader California map, now you can see there kind of the left-hand side of the gray area um, is is where Lodi is located. And this is a, obviously a very general map. It just shows the broadest regions of California. But it, there's a crucial point to make through this map and that you can see there the, the gray area in the center is the inland valleys. Some people also call it the Central Valley. But notice what an enormous um, geographical area that Central Valley or inland valleys area is. But also remember, um, Jenny, if you could indicate where the X marks the spot was there just left of, of the, um, you could see there's the uh, bay complex. And so Lodi really sits at the intersection of the Central Valley with the California Delta region. What I want to point out here, though, is that the X is directly east of that Golden Gate opening in the coastal range. This is really important because sometimes people make the mistake of thinking Lodi is simply part of the Central Valley. And while it is situated at the, in the Central Valley, it is very importantly situated where the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta intersects the Central Valley. And this is crucially important because what it means is that Lodi actually is coastally influenced even though it sits in the more inland part of the state. And here's how. Now you'll again notice how incredibly huge this, this gray mass of, of the Central Valley or inland valleys is. Now, as temperatures increase over the course of the day, heat, hot air rises, as we all know. And some of you, if you've seen me do a webinar on Lodi before, you've heard me talk about this, but this is really important for us to all understand. So hot air rises. But what that means is that as temperatures increase and go up over the course of the day, it actually creates almost like a vacuum or an empty spot where that air that had been down by the ground is lifting, lifting, lifting higher into the air and creating a vacuum effect down on the ground level. But notice how incredibly huge the Central Valley is located. And now imagine that the, as that entire region of the Central Valley heats up and hot air rises from that almost, it's a about half the length of the state of California, creating a vacuum effect, right? So as hot air rises in the Central Valley, that vacuum effect down at the ground level must be filled in with air from somewhere. But the one place where there's an opening that could fill in the Central Valley is just in that one area where the Sacramento-San Joaquin rivers intersect and create a delta that connects into a bay complex that includes both San Pablo and, and San Francisco Bay, and then opens out to the Pacific Ocean through the Golden Gate, where the Golden Gate Bridge is situated. The reason this matters is because that is a really tiny little air area of opening, having to fill in all of that air for the entire Central Valley. That's again, about half the length of the state of California. So, Every single day, like clockwork in the afternoon, that, that air is getting sucked through the Golden Gate across the bays over the California Delta and directly 
over Lodi itself. If we could go to the next map, you'll see this is that profound air, air movement. And notice how you, this map is um, nicely done because it's showing there's the Golden Gate, there where the arrows start. You can see the San Francisco San Pablo Bay complex. It uh, then goes into the intersection of the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. And then notice there the Delta. It's really this series of islands and kind of fingerling um, type rivers that go all the way into the westernmost part of Lodi. And so again, my pointing out that Lodi sits at the intersection of the Central Valley and the California River Delta is really to say that this, this afternoon current of air and, and moist, moist air, especially coming off of the Pacific Ocean gets all the way, it hits Lodi directly every afternoon, and then it turns and spreads through the rest of the Central Valley from there. And so this is, that's part of what I mean when I say it's a coastally influenced area and the intersection of the Central Valley with the California Delta area. So if we go to the next map, then Madeline can start to tell us more about what this means. You'll notice again, you see a little bit of the Bay Complex there on the left, the intersection of the two rivers and then the Delta. And he, this map shows us the seven nesty, nested AVAs within the Lodi AVA. So Lodi became its own AVA in 1986, and then seven nested AVAs were approved in 2006. But you'll notice that there's a little bit of Lodi that is not actually a nested AVA there on the south and then on the western part. And so Madeline, this first, this first wine is actually coming from this western area that is part of the Lodi AVA, but situated all the way into the California Delta. And um, Jenny, if you could actually indicate, you'll notice that way down there by Terminus is where this under the sea vineyard that we're gonna start talking about is located. And the crucial thing to point out is that this area is literally below sea level. Um, and so we'll show one map and then I'll hand it over to Madeline or a uh, photo and I'll hand it over to Madeline. Um, Th thanks, Elaine. You, uh, you relieved me of having to start at the very beginning and you did a fantastic job <laughs> of you. explaining that coastal in influence. And um, I do want to touch on uh, just as much as the cooling influence that we get from uh, the West. An interesting part about the Delta, um, I wanted to touch on two areas, the hydrology and the cultural aspects of the Delta. So looking at this map shows such an uh, incredible Delta system with all those waters that are draining down from the Sierra Nevadas. When we have that incredibly long valley, those waters that the snowpack and all of our storm water that gets stored up in the Sierra Nevadas for tens of thousands of years, those waters would melt in the winters and spring and head down through the waterways and collect into our Delta waterway area. And to just paint a picture about what that looked like uh, back in the 1800s, these waterways would completely flood in the winter and spring and would be filled as a marshy wetland with lots of plant wildlife and riparian wildlife. And then over the course of the summer would drain into these smaller streams and waterways. And it wasn't really until the mid 1850s when we had the huge influx of people coming to the area with the gold rush that they were accessing these waterways to head up to the foothills. And then we had a large influx of labor that had just finished building the railroads, mainly Chinese workers that were looking for work. And so more and more this Delta waterland water uh, area became reclaimed. The dikes and the levees that naturally had formed with all the movement of that flooding were built up higher and higher so that farming became the main use of all this area. So much so that as Elaine alluded to that many of these areas and islands are completely below sea level. Um, the, Jenny, could you advance two slides to show the photo of the area? That's great. So my husband will be very excited that we get to include him. That's my husband, Ben Culver, and my oldest son, Simon. And we had the pleasure of taking Elaine on a levee walk out in Terminus Island, which is one of the Terminus track in the Delta. And you can see that that levee that we're standing on 
is just a few feet above the Sycamore Slough, which is a waterway that drains out into the Delta. And it gives you a great perspective of just how low these vineyards can be. Um, and the reason I brought up the history about the hydrology is that you can imagine all that plant life over thousands and thousands of years collected into this area. And with that flooding also came incredible amounts of sand and minerals down from the Sierra Nevadas. So before we plant a vineyard, we take great care to do soil tests and mix up those soils so that we have a good mix of those fertile, rich peat soils, as well as incorporating that mineral sandy layer. So these vineyards have incredible water holding, holding capacity, so much so that we need to be mindful of how wet the vineyards can get. We, um, in some places, even install tile drains, which are uh, channels through the vineyard that drain the water out to drainage ditches. And throughout these islands, these drainage ditches then converge into a pumping station, which will put the water back into the Delta waterway. So I'd love to talk about that is uh, really different than some of the other areas we're gonna hear about. Well, and Madeline, Bill is asking about, you know, what, what the reality of flooding dangers is in this area. And I know um, something that Ben um, talked about when we were doing that levee walk was just that there, each island in the Delta has a person whose job is literally to walk the levees twice every day, right? There is a, a reclamation district or a levee and reclamation district on every island that their sole purpose is to maintain the integrity of those levees because any weak spot and the whole island could go underwater, which has happened in the past. And once it goes under, it would take years and years years and years to reclaim it again. So great care is taken to do projects to, to make sure those levees are sound. That's great, thank you. Well, and one of the other questions that's coming up is considering the water levels of soils there, um, could you speak just briefly to how irrigation is managed in those areas? Sure, we always hope for winter rains. That's the best when we can really hope for getting a nice flush of natural water but that doesn't always happen. Um, some of the vineyards are, could even be dry farmed because the water table is so high. But in this particular vineyard under the sea, we have a drip irrigation system, but it's not sourced with groundwater. It's actually sourced from surface water out of these waterways that are drawn to the pump by siphon. So the tidal swing is important to know when we're setting that up for the day is, uh, how high or low is it going to be because it will affect our pumping. Right. And so, so there is some intentional irrigation, but it's actually managed through the, t I, I just, I think like, okay, again, I made the claim that Lodi is coastally influenced. So just to reemphasize the point that that's true, notice what she just said, that entire area in the westernmost part of Lodi is literally tidally influenced. Tides go in and out in this area. Okay, so, uh, you know, just to reemphasize that, but let's go and ahead and look. Oh, go ahead. One other thing I just wanted to know is salt intake. We are very mindful of our irrigation that with all that high table uh, water table that we do need to be mindful about getting enough fresh water to flush salts down. So rootstock choice is important as well as uh, adequate irrigation. Right No, Thank you. So let's go ahead and um, look at this first wine. Um, Jenny, if we could just see the first um, wine slide. Again, this is from, entirely from what is called the Under the Sea Vineyard, and it's in that um, the terminus area that Madeline was just describing. This wine actually, um, the 2019 vintage was named one of the top 100 wines in the world by Wine Spectator, which is a pretty significant, significant accomplishment. But I also love um, being able to include this wine because the value is off the hook. Like it's just a great example of how, um, you know, kind of mindful farming can deliver quality at a really affordable price. This, is, this wine's a great example from, for that. And I know, um, you know, that's just, it's a 
really important point to try to find wines of value that really over deliver and both for um, buy the glass programs as we're starting to open up restaurants again and also just for affordable retail as well. So this wine was done uh, um, whole cluster press and then um, fermented really long, cool, slow ferment, um, which helps preserve aromatics and really capture that fruit transparency um, in, in stainless steel. They did not encourage ML, so it's, um, it's mostly um, no ML conversion on this particular one. And I be believe the rest of you have this, have these wines as well. Is that right? Could we, um, Kevin, do you have, do you have the wines with you as well? I do. I would love, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this wines. I, um, but for me, what really stands out is there's just this like wash of palate stimulation, like tons of, um, what the French like to call sapidity, just like really gets your mouth. It's not just acid, but actually it's like, Sapidity is when your mouth, it, the, like the micro musk muscles of your mouth are like squeezing and stimulated. So instead of just having acid stimulation, you're actually getting full palate stimulation. And I, I love how strongly this wine does that. And then, and then just a beautiful sense of, of um, flavor. And so Kevin, you're at, you know, you farm such a big mix of, of varieties there in Lodi. And I'd love to hear your thoughts as you taste this white wine. So I'm a big fan of uh, Lodi White Wines and, uh, you know, the Delta area, I think, is, uh, is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the best spots that some of the white wines in Lodi uh, produce. Um, I haven't had this one before, so I'm uh, very surprised uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting out of it. It's a, it's a lovely wine. The, the minerality on it is uh, spectacular um, for a wine that has no ML. It's got a very... Um, to me, it's got a very round uh, mouthfeel, and, and uh, no, it's uh, it's it's uh, the aromatics are uh, phenomenal. And you know, I uh, being that it's ten a.m., I intended on spitting, but <laughs> I haven't even looked at my spit cup since uh, since I found this wine. <laughs> well, no, I I I love your point though that there's like this really great acid line, but then really nice um, texture and. Um, um, it's not really fleshy. It's more almost like a uh, soft candle wax kind of texture, just like a really nice um, mouthfeel. And even um, there's this great acid line too. So Madeline, one of the other things to point out though too is, um, you know, you uh, again, multi-generational farming family in Lodi and um, Ripken, you know, through Ripken Winery, your dad helped bring in this incredible diversity of, of grapes in the region. And that that's part of what helped lead you into the Delta and, and into white wines in particular. And um, Lodi actually has the greatest diversity of grape varieties in the state of California, over a hundred different varieties growing in Lodi. And so this Grenache Blanc is just one example of, of whites, but could you tell us a little, just a little bit more about that history, your family bringing in so many different varieties? Yeah, my dad went to UC Davis and came back and decided he did not want to be a row cropper and started planting uh, vines in the more uh, modern way of getting it up on wire and just had a passion for all different types of varieties. We still have about 40 different varieties on the ranch and he loved stimulating conversation with people that had an interest in finding these lesser known varieties and he was very proud that Lodi was an ideal spot to grow high quality for all different types and when someone like clinker brick that would latch on to an interest he'd be willing to graft over more and more of his vineyards to encourage that passion he was so happy when he'd find someone else who knew about tempranillo or Roussan or marsan and just would love to talk about it for days so uh while we have more of our conventional farming that's larger more common Chardonnay and Pinot Gris and um, Petite Syrah, some of the more well-known varieties. It's still a part of the passion of Ripken of, and here at KG is being able to farm so many different types. Well, and I was lucky enough to be able to sit down and talk with your dad um, for a while. I guess it's everything was happened two years ago now. <laughs> I've realized every time I talk about the last time I 
spoke with someone in person, I have to say, oh, two years ago, <laughs> everything's two years ago now. But, but one of the things that really struck me was that um, he, every variety he talked through or that I'd ask him about, he, it was finding out how it grew and like what he needed to do differently to grow those vines. That really was what excited him. It was almost like the fact that it tastes different in the bottle was totally secondary to the fact that here's this unique new plant. You know, he was, just seemed totally in love with the farming. He was, he was a passion and, and it, it's hard to follow someone with such a passion like that because uh, some of our focuses change, but it's still part of my heritage and looking towards the future. I'm, I'm positive that if we can find these varieties that people love, there's going to be more and more diversity. Yeah, that's great. Well, and so a question that's come in from Rebecca, she's, you know, she's remarking on how unique this area that you've just described in the Delta is. Is there any um, interest in Lodi for um, designating a kind of a Delta nested AVA out there? It has potential. It's just another uh, project to put on the list, but if we could come up with a great name, I do think it has unique characteristics that it could potentially be a, a specific sub-appellation of Lodi, for sure. Cool. Great. Well, so let's keep looking at um, other parts of Lodi and, and um, go ahead and take a look at this next wine. Um, and so, Jenny, if we could go ahead and pull up the, uh, the uh, wine slide. Um, so I'm really excited about this. We have um, now, Aaron, I'm going to have you pronounce the grape variety because I said it, I said it over the phone and you, and you pointed out how, that I could say it differently than I was. So you want to go ahead and tell us what we're about to. Sure. Uh, I, I, I uh, don't have any Italian in my blood, but uh, I think it's pronounced Alianico. The G is silent. So it's not Aglianico, uh, Alianico. But then again, we're from Lodi when, you know, back in the day, we used to pronounce Petit Sera as Petit Sera. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're getting there. My uh, favorite, though, is um, Kerrigan for Carignan. Kerrigan. Yeah, well, yeah. hey, we still, there's a lot of guys who still say Kerrigan. Around yeah, here, absolutely. So, but um, anyway. You have to, like, travel the area with your Lodi code book. You do. You do have to travel with the Lodi code book. But that's all right. You know, we're, uh, we're very much invested in the crop. But we're also open to learning new, new the proper ways to pronounce these, uh, some of these French terms. Well, and so Jenny, if we could go back to the AVA map, um, one of the things though, that Aaron, that I really want to point out is that, you know, we were just hearing from uh, Madeline about how, um, you know, Ripken brought in lots of different varieties, white, uh, white varieties, as well as red, but, um, you know, you with, with Lang Twins have really worked with your winemaker to identify even more new varieties that seem would seem to suit the climate of Lodi really well. And so this particular wine, the Alianico, is grown there in the Jehan AVA. And uh, notice that this is the smallest geographically sized AVA of the region. So of the seven, Jehan is the smallest. It's right in the middle there. And um, and kind of your what I think of as your home ranch is really located there. Um, in Jay Hunt and where this particular wine is grown, if I recall correctly. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so we're kind of nestled in on uh, a couple hundred acres in the crook of the McCallum River, and it's getting really close to where the McCallum and the consumeness come together in Dry Creek, Jay Hunt Slough, and Gill Creek. So we get a lot more activity from the little tributaries of the McCallum and what drains into the McCallum and uh, in that watershed. And so we are a specific uh, AVA nestled. Uh, within the larger Lodi AVA. It's about 9,000 acres total, but only, uh, I'm sorry, about 9,000 acres of vineyard and about 28,000 acres in total area. So it's one of the smaller ones, uh, typically a little heavier soils than what you would find in, uh, in Lodi proper. But as you get closer to the river, they definitely turn more sandy and sandy loam. Um, but it's a wonderful little spot to grow uh, wine grapes, uh, but really only wine grapes have been planted here for the last maybe 40 years or so to any degree. Most of the because we do have some hills uh, where we need drip irrigation. And so it wasn't really all that conducive to, uh, you know, to ditch irrigation, uh, which was the primary irrigation method back in the day. But as you get up towards the Clements area, that's when you really get into the serious hills uh, much more than what we have uh, here in the Jayhan AVA. Well, but so let me just pause really quick to um, clarify for people. So, so um, Madeline mentioned that people started really pushing into the Lodi area kind of in the 1850s. And so vines start growing into Lodi in like starting 1850s and going on from there. 
but historically it was really like small family sized ranches, um, mainly in what you see there is the McCallamy River uh, nested AVA. And so the highest concentration of vineyards in Lodi is McCallamy River. It's also the most um, kind of historically important because vines all went in there first. Mm -hmm. Speaking to Aaron's point, it was um, kind of a relatively speaking flatter area and easier soils to, to farm in as well. And so historically Lodi actually, thanks to this McCallamy River area, um, it, at one point um, Lodi was known as the watermelon capital of the United States. It then became the Flame Tokay, uh, which was a gorgeous um, bright pinky orange table wine or table grape. Uh, it was the Flame Tokay capital of the United States. And then um, by 1920s to 30s, the Zinfandel capital of the United States. But all again, thanks to the really uh, accessible soils of the McCallum River AVA. And Jenny, we've got actually a soil photo for Jay Hunt, just to really help illustrate Aaron's point about um, the soils for this area. So again, still, still loamy, but a little bit heavier in comparison to what we'll see in a minute with McCallum River. Yeah, that's right. And so um, and as to your point earlier about Alianico and what we've been doing and experimenting with some of these more uh, Italian and Mediterranean varietals, uh, we really feel that they fit very well to our uh, AVA, um, more so than what we've found uh, with the Spanish varietals like Tempranillo. Um, and just because we feel like the, the tannic structure of these Italian wines uh, really uh, fit better in this, in this climate, we think that they have longer tannins, a little softer tannins. Um, that we can uh, add to our, our portfolio. And so this Alianico is actually, the rosé part of it was actually kind of discovered by a mistake because we uh, planted this vineyard about, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I think it was in 2017 was its first crop, 2018 was the second crop. And we were really trying to find a way to, uh, to enhance the red wine. That was the purpose, it was on red. Um, and so we did a, just a signe and tried to concentrate um, the, the fermentation a little bit to extract more color. And the signe, uh, we, we saved as a rosé, and it was such a beautiful wine that we decided to put basically almost the whole block uh, to uh, rosé. Um, and so that's what we've been doing since. It's a real slow, cool fermentation. This wine uh, was all native fermentation, um, it, so we didn't use any yeast on the primary fermentation. Um, and it was uh, just, it really turns out to be a beautiful, floral, savory uh, rosé that maintains great acidity, which is one of Alianico's uh, main features, is that um, it uh, produces really nice, beautiful color, maintains that acidity in a warmer climate. This is uh, really within a stone's throw of the Macaulay River, honestly. It's right on the border of the, of the river in sandy soils on St. George. St. George being you know, one of the oldest rootstocks around because it's purely uh, vitus repestris. Um, and it does uh, very well in this area. It's not a, um, uh, an overly uh, vigorous rootstock, but it is one that does cause some shatter um, during, during set, meaning that it helps us keep those clusters a little bit looser, more naturally um, in a varietal like Alianica, which tend, can, can be, it tends to overcrop if you're not uh, watching it carefully. So we really take care to, to make sure that this wine is, uh, these grapes are grown properly. Um, and then once it gets into the, uh, um, the winery, we just gotta make sure the winemakers don't screw it up. Which is basically, I mean, honestly, we talk about where wine is growing. You know, most yeah. of it's grown in the field, as much as I respect winemakers and what they do, um, you know, you cannot make a great wine from poor grapes. Well, no, that's absolutely the point, I think, is um, you, uh... You can screw up great grapes, yes. but you can't, you can't pretend to have great grapes. Like you have to start with good, good um, source material to make a great wine. Um, but you could, you know, you can really screw it up in the cellar, but, but can't really do it the other way. But this is 100% stainless, right? Correct. Yeah, 100% stainless. Yep. And a question came in about RS. My understanding, though, is that this wine is dry, right? Uh, no, it's not. It's got a little bit of RS. I don't, um, it, I believe it's like about eight grams uh, per liter. So it's not dry, but that was, it would stop naturally. So um, the fermentation uh, halted on its own and we, we left it as it was and, and bottled it as such. What I love about it, though, is the, the acidity really cleans the palate, you know, mm -hmm. so I get a little bit of that kind of uh, glisse mouthfeel that can come from that touch of RS. So, you know, it kind of just feels almost like slippery a little mm -hmm. bit, but then the, the acidity really cuts through that and cl just cleans the palate. And so it's just a lovely balance that's in that way. 
And uh, especially speaking to your point with using, um, you know, ambient yeast or natural fermentation, you know, this is what the wine wanted to do. And I think it, it shows in the, again, in that palate balance. But Phil, I think you have the wines too. I was hoping to hear your thoughts on, do you not you have know, this one? I didn't open it up. <laughs> He's saving it, good man. I'm saving He's smart. It. <laughs> the thing about this wine that strikes me is, again, it's got that real fruit purity. Alianico like likes to give exuberant fruit. You know, I, you, may, you do make it as a red wine as well, right? Yeah, we do. So we do. So, uh, but it's two different fermentations. Um, and so this one, like I said, it was done the Signe style. So what they do is they crush it like a red uh, and then we put it in tank and then we let it sit in tank for a period of time and we monitor the color. Um, and then, and I say we, like I'm the winemaker in there. No, I'm busy harvesting grapes. I'm not doing that part. Um, but we monitor the color to see exactly when they get that perfect, uh, that perfect color that they want. And then they uh, drain the gallons that they want to make uh, the rosé out of and leave the rest of the uh, pump, the rest of the um, uh, must there to ferment with the red. So the um, there are questions coming in about how much Ilianico is planted in Jehan and Lodi, but you're the first to bring it in, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm the only one in uh, Ilianico, I think, in the Jehan Appalachian. I do know a couple other wineries that do have Ilianico planted. I'm not sure to what degree. There's probably only about 100 to 150 acres in California total. Um, that would be my estimation. We grow uh, like about six or eight. Yeah, I know there's a little bit in Paso Robles. Um, mm -hmm. It tends to want a slightly warmer area um, just to fully ripen. But you, but again, with this um, acidity, you can see that that coastal influence is also speaking to the wine. I like to comment, I think it was Becca made about the white, which I really see in this red as well. One of the gifts of Lodi in, in terms of wine character, I think, is that you get this full sun exposure fruit expression where you get like really nice exuberant fruit, but then you get that cool climate coastal influenced acid at the same time. And it's really hard to find regions that can truly deliver that combination. And so, and I really see it in both the white and the rosé. Madeline, you were making a point of letting all of us know <laughs> that you were drinking the rosé just now. So I'd love to hear your comments on the wine. Who doesn't love this color? I mean, come on. <laughs> Elaine's wearing the perfect shirt for it today. It was I mean, planned. It was rose, totally planned. Yeah. Rosé is hot. <laughs> it's just way to start off a, an evening. I think we've had many of these bottles with uh, some of the panelists here tonight or today. Who doesn't love that? And I also think that rosé um, is so much more versatile than what people think it is. Um, you know, every there's uh, this there is this mindset out there, at least there was that rosé has to only be uh, as a pre dinner or a pre meal appetizer or a glass rosé by the pool. I mean, with some of with the rosés that are being produced from these other varietals um, really uh, can can be paired with many different meals as well. And so they have the strength um, to to pair with a meal and don't just have to be with your salad. So I encourage folks to, you know, when in doubt, order a rosé. You'll be surprised how well it pairs with things. Well, and one of the comments that's coming in from Christopher too is that, you know, the there's a ton of, for those of you that have the bottle, there's a ton of information on the back label. And Aaron, you know, every conversation you and I have had, you've really emphasized how important transparency is to you. And that, again, you've helped evolve the Lodi Rules program and, and the original wine growers workbook. And, you know, for in our conversations, the thing you've emphasized is that you think that sense of transparency of farming practices really is the point. Yeah, I think we need to be honest and transparent about how we're making the wines. I mean, like even to your point, uh, this wine tastes dry, but it's actually, uh, it, it has a little bit of residual. Um, and so we just try to be straight up with people to give them the information and, um, and help them learn about the wine and help them uh, measure what they're tasting. And so uh, for us, uh, some people may brush it off as just too much info. Others will really deep dive as wine geeks do uh, and really enjoy it. So um, we encourage it. And it's, it's one of the tenets of the Lodi Rules uh, wine growing philosophy is to be able to provide folks transparency from how we grow it to how we make the wine. And we like to see that through with the label. Yeah, that's great. So we're gonna, we're gonna come back Aaron and talk about some other key aspects of Lodi rules with you, but I'd like to bring Phil in now too, before we do that, in order to um, go ahead and talk about the third wine. Um, we, uh, we've started with two wines that were um, made going straight to press, uh, the Klinkerbrick Ganache Blanc and then the um, Lang Twins Alianico. And so now we get to move into um, the red wine arena. 
And um, part of why I want to bring this in now too is because Aaron was just talking about the growing conditions of Jay Hunt and how they contrast with McCallum River. But Phil, you um, you know you're unique in this panel in that you're really farming wines from one area. The other three are farming from across Lodi, multiple areas, and some outside of Lodi as well. But again, you had a prior career as a firefighter and then kind of came home and, and started um, helping your family do some farming. I have to go ahead and bring up the family photos just because it just drives home the point. And I love, this is actually the first time I got to meet um, your dad and your uncle. I took this photo of the two of them. They the have been, I, I just, I'm so in love with this photo and it really captures how incredibly sweet they both are and really funny as well. And um, they actually grew up third generation um, farmers in Lodi obviously help raise Phil on, into farming as well. But this, um, they've been farming since they were seven years old. And, and your dad, from what I recall, 74 vintages of home wine making. Is that right? Elaine, real quick, can we just say, take a quick poll. Who, how many people in the audience would love to have one of those guys as your grandpa? No, I mean, honestly, right? I know. Like, that is just like the picture perfect. I, I want that guy to be my grandfather. It's honestly like I come up with excuses to go out to Lodi just so I can sit on the porch with them, you know? Oh, man. Um, yeah, they, he's been making wine for a long time. A lot of that, though, was as an assistant winemaker to my grandfather, though, you know, but but he was still involved with the wines. Uh, it's It's been a lot of years, uh, at least 60, probably, you know, on and off that he's helped out. Uh, plus, yes. And this is the three of you together. I, but I love that story too, that, um, you know, they learned farming and um, winemaking with their dad and, um, and you, you know, your dad was, was making wine side by side with his dad. And then as you were growing up, you started being part of making that wine with them too, just like home, home supply. Yes. Yeah. And I've been lucky enough to get to have a couple different vintages sitting on the porch with you. It's, um, <laughs> So much fun just really speaks to the really special history of the region. Um, but one of the things that I want to bring up, though, you know, we touched on it earlier, but, you know, like I said, you know, you had a previous career and um, and so had they really, you know, you had grown up doing some farming with your family, of course. But when you came back to focus on the family ranches and, and grow around that area in McCallum River, you were in a situation where it was important to, um, you yeah, we can focus on the map there. So McCallum River, again, it's the historic um, growing area of Lodi. And your, you know, as I mentioned, McCallum River really is mainly is family size ranches and, um, and the oldest growing area of Lodi and the highest concentration of vineyards are all in McCallum River. And so you are there basically farming your, your ranch and your parents' ranch side by side in, um, in the Victor area. But in, in, move changing careers and coming back to farming you know one of the things you talked about was how that toolkit really helped you figure out how to how to farm how to do it well and you you mentioned so, both soil management and water management were two of the tenants of that wine growers workbook that really helped you and one of the questions that's that did come in um from viewers was just that point about soil health and how and they're really curious to hear some examples of how of how people are focusing on soil health and that kind of more regenerative side of soil farming. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, and, and getting back to uh, what we what I talked about earlier, the first time I got into Lodi rules, it was amazing how encompassing that was for our farming operation. I, I was amazed uh, with how in depth it went through the whole, our whole farming operation. But getting back to soils, yes, um, we have some challenges with our, our vineyards, especially on my dad's. Uh, as, as we progress through the years, we would furrow irrigate. I mean, that's, that's how we irrigated everything. And basically we would take and uh, run water between the vines in a furrow and that would irrigate the vines. But the problem was is that most of these fields were uneven. So you had to dig in a bunch of dams by hand to water the field so you got a uniform coverage of the water. I pause you just for a second. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure people know. So furrow irrigation or, and then there's a kind of adjacent flood irrigation. 
around the world, this was traditionally how um, vineyards were watered. And, and it's important to note that a lot of the areas in the world that um, claim that no, you know, there's no irrigation is allowed still actually sometimes use flood irrigation, which is where you just brush water over the, all the entire ground coverage. So there, um, it is the case that parts of the world do not allow drip irrigation, but we should be careful to understand that some of those parts of the world still actually do use furrow and flood irrigation, which is where you just flood water over the ground. So that's an important point to note. But until the advent of drip irrigation, which really didn't take hold until the end of the 80s, start of the 90s, the way to water your property, whether it's for vines or otherwise, was to literally flood water into it. And so um, one of the um, historical changes that Lodi went through was long ago, like in the 1800s, they would just flood the whole ground. But then for the sake of water efficiency, people realized if they hand dug ditches between vine rows, and you just block up the ends, then you could fill the ditches with water and you were still essentially flooding the ground, but only in specific areas between vine rows. And so you can tell who's, who grew up in Lodi because their stories include playing in the water ditches as little kids and knowing it was okay for them to get muddy as hell, as long as they didn't break the dam. Because <laughs> the whole point was do not make your parents have to go out and fix that ditch. If you want to get muddy, that's fine, but don't don't break the sides of the ditch, and and then you're okay. So anyway, I just but wanted to make sure. To that's hard to do as a kid, and, and <laughs> my bottom was red more than once because I did not do that. Because <laughs> you so. broke the ditch, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, that was never good. And then it was <laughs> flood to the other end, and we were just still playing, but yeah, they'd eventually find you. Um, so back to soil health, uh, you know, because of the furrow irrigation. Um, it was a it was really hard to to dig in all those dams so as they replanted vineyards they would go in and level those vineyards and and so they could get a nice uniform coverage of irrigation water with the furrow irrigation and that was great but on a couple of our places my dad's in particular uh they took all that nice topsoil two or two feet at least and moved it to the bottom end of the field and and now you have more of a sterile you know, uh, soil structure that's not, you know, that, that two feet of, of live soil, they've moved to the other end. And so we have some issues with our farming operation that, uh, that Lodi rules is, you know, as you do, as you look at the program and, and you see what, what options you have, they give you research material to look at and research it. And so as you do that, you figure out, how, okay, how can I get these soils back? And they give you those tools to, to bring it back. And so through cover crop and um, and also uh, composting, uh, we're we're bringing those soils back, but it's going to take years uh, because of that. And so th that's something that Lodi Rules is is shown me and uh, helped me research. And and we're working on those soils now. But it, it, those type of processes of bringing soils back take years and years. Yeah. And, and by doing that, what it does is it helps you with nutrient uptake with your vineyards. Uh, with your vines, and it also helps with uh, retaining water. And so those are two benefits that we're going to, you know, gain as we get better and better at rejuvenating those soils. Well, and Kevin, you've talked, you know, you've talked quite a bit about cover crops and forgive me, <laughs> but we have to show this photo of you um, just because it's such a great illustration of how dramatic cover crops can be. I love, I love this photo of you though, but um, but, you know, Kevin, I was hoping you could kind of build on what Phil was saying and, you know, you spent a bunch of time. This is, um, this is Kevin sitting in Bechtold Vineyard, which is the oldest Cinso vineyard in the world and the oldest um, vineyard in Lodi, um, planted in 1886. Is that right? Um, so, yeah, this is a you know, very old vineyard. It's, a, you know, just a pure sand pit. Um, but... Uh, you know, as Phil was saying, the uh, cover crops are a major component for the uh, for the building of the soils. And, you know, so this location over on the McCallamy, uh, the McCallamy River Appalachian, you know, it's, you know, it's famous for its, you know, for its pure beach sand. And this, uh, this vineyard's uh, probably on the extreme end of that. And so with, uh, when I took over this vineyard, we, uh, we started a, uh, you know, we started 
intensively cover cropping it, trying to build that soil, trying to build that tilth to uh, to add uh, you know nutrients. This Phil was talking about um, water retention, and there's certain things you know cover crops are a great tool, and certain you pick your mix a lot of times based on what your needs are. You know, so in this particular vineyard, we actually mix in about 15% mustard because it, it throws that big tap root and we're, uh, and we're pulling some of the, uh, pulling some nutrients that are way farther down and pulling them back into that, uh, uh, that uh, organic layer on the top so it can break down easier and make it uh, more accessible for the vines. Well, I love that point though, that you just sort of intimated that, um, cover crops are, are not just about kind of what grows on the surface, but really like the different, some, some of the plants that you pick for cover crop are based on the very different root structures. And so some, sometimes you want uh, plants that are going to help fix nitrogen, but sometimes you want plants that have a type of uh, larger root that will help break up the soils or a deeper root that'll help pull nutrients back to the surface as well. And so it really depends on kind of the structure of the soil that you're dealing with. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and Phil, so on your side, you know, you're, you're further east. This is all the way west in, within the McCallamy River AVA, but Phil, on kind of going more east on your side of McCallamy River, what, what sorts of cover crops are you dealing with there? Uh, we've done a lot of triticale. Um, we're just looking to uh, just break up that soil and get a biomass back in uh, yearly is what, what a majority of what we've done. We've kind of mixed it up a little bit and, and uh, done a little bit of radish uh, lately just to help with soil compaction uh, and to change it up a little bit so we're not doing the same cover crop over and over. Um, the, on my place, my Syrah, we went ahead and did a permanent cover crop of grasses and um, so that's what we're doing. Right, that's great. Um, well, so let's go ahead and look at this wine. Um, you know, um, Aaron mentioned that the Elianico Rosé is a natural fermentation. The McKay Cellars Syrah is as well. Um, he likes to do extended aging um, in barrel. So anywhere between a year and a half to two years, depending on, um, on the vintage. And um, this with Syrah, he tends to do around 25 to 30% um, new oak, again, depending a little bit on the vintage. So this particular um, wine comes entirely from the Abba Vineyard. And Phil, you're growing this Syrah, but also, you also, of course, your family farms Zinfandel and has, again, since the 1800s. But, but um, from what I recall in the 1990s, towards the end of the 1990s, you decided to start bringing in these Rhone varieties and so now have both Grenache and Syrah at that site? Uh, yes, so uh, on our vineyard at my, my place, uh, we're Syrah and that was 1996 is when we planted Syrah. And then uh, the Grenache is a newer addition uh, about 10 years ago and that's over on my dad's home, home place over there. Mm -hmm. And the two sites are side by side though. Uh, pretty close. Area. There's yeah. there's about I don't know, 800 feet between them. <laughs> Full transparency Almost. of information. <laughs> there's 800 feet. <laughs> to be distance. exact. Yeah, to be exact. Well, maybe it was 821 feet, but I, you know, to Aaron's point, it's you know transparent. Um, Kevin, it looks like you're you're tasting this wine too. Do you want to comment on it? Sure, I'm a big fan of uh, I'm a big fan of McKay and. Uh, this is the first time I've ever had this uh, specific wine. You know, I love the the old world, almost leathery aspect to it. You know, with just a you know a touch of uh, just a touch of uh, like candied apple on the finish. The well, uh, you know Mike uh, Mike does a great job with these wines, and uh, this vineyard. It's funny I see this vineyard all the time. Um, you know, because Phil's right in my right in my neighborhood as I'm driving between different blocks and. Uh, this one always catches the eye because it's a uh, a very unique uh, a very unique trellis system. So it doesn't matter how many times I go by it, I'm almost doing a double take because it's like it's like my uh, eyes are playing tricks on me because it's so uh, it's so unique for the area. No, absolutely. Well, and the Syrah is actually harder to find um, in shop, but the um, he's McKay is also making Grenache from this site, and so some people would have had that wine as well. Um, so, uh, uh, Phil, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this or not. So, because of course, Mike is the one that made this wine, but 
he bottles this as the Lodi, Lodi Appalachian rather than McCallum River. Any comments about reasons for that? Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know I can just give a general answer that sometimes people will choose the larger AVA because it's a more recognizable na name. Mm -hmm. um, whereas McCallum River um, sort of, you're, it's more likely you'll know it if you're here in California or specifically in Lodi. So sometimes um, winemakers will choose the better known name. So that would be my best guess. But um, I also, I just, you know, Madeline, it looked like you were in the middle of tasting this wine as well. Do you wanna add anything else to it? I just love the blueberry character. I just, that's the thing that hits me. Um, just that full mouthfeel of blueberry. Well, I love the, fr I, the fruit on it. I feel like this wine really hits at that point that we mentioned earlier too, where you get that almost, um, almost like hybrid climate conditions. Cause you do get like, yeah, that really nice blueberry, but then you get that kind of cooler climate, um, more savory earthy side like Kevin was describing too and I just again it's it's not a lot of regions in the world that give you that more hybrid character rather than just warm or cool climate you know and so that we're seeing that in the red here as well um, yeah this this vineyard as as it's aged um initially it was more fruit forward I mean it was just mainly fruit you know there's a little bit of spice but it seems as it's aged we're picking up more and more spices with with the tasting with the tasting notes so um, so one of the questions that's come in, Greg is asking um, if you're experiencing any issues with Syrah decline. It, my impression is that the vines would be a little too young to be hitting that point yet. Do you want to add uh, anything? The, the vine, let's see. So we're we're coming up on almost 25 years of planted, but uh, I haven't had any Syrah decline. This vineyard has been, I mean, Syrah grows like crazy um, and it's still fairly vigorous, especially on the vines that are that are we pull the shoots up uh, with a very unique uh, as Kevin was talking a very unique trellis system we we pull half the vines up and half the vines we pull down like a reverse VSP so um, there's there's a reason why it's not planted anywhere else in Lodi I was foolish enough to plant it but uh, it it has helped wine quality I believe so. well yeah so Syrah likes to be vigorous and it, the canopy grows really um significantly but one of the tricks that phil has developed is by when you you know vine wants to grow up and so if we were to let vines grow naturally they would literally become like curtains up trees they like try to climb 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 as high as they can and so one of the ways to help reduce vigor and slow down canopy growth is you literally take the canes and pull train them down and so phil has um kind of essentially taken half of each vine and trained it down and then the other the other um half more normal actually it's every other vine oh it's every other vine okay yeah so half the vines and that's than the problem vine. with the system is that eventually over time that the lower vines lose their vigor lose their vigor and and it's hard to get it back so right eventually we'll probably have to retrain the vig vineyard to you know something a little more manageable otherwise eventually we'll just eventually the lower vines will just get less and less and um you know it, it's it's already affecting their health a little bit so well so one of the things to note about Syrah California has had Syrah as a variety um, as a variety since the late 1800s it's been in the state but it's actually very hard to find old vine Syrah because um, Syrah is more susceptible to wood diseases and so it does not tend to age as long as other varieties like um, Kerrigan or um, Zinfandel and so um, so it's hard to find old vine Syrah and actually interestingly it has it has consistently been in historic field blends, but tends to um, kind of age out of those field blends. So the oldest vineyards in California often don't have Syrah. And we didn't actually get a single vin or single varietal bottling of Syrah in California until the mid 1970s, which I just think is an interesting historical tidbit. And but part of it is again, because it is a little bit more challenging to grow in in many parts of the state, and so people just weren't as focused on it until um, until, until Phil decided he was crazy enough to do it. <laughs> um, that was so, really that was really the boom of Syrah was you know the late nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, there was only I want to say a hundred or two hundred acres in the state, and then and towards the end of the nineties that craze started to take off, and that's when the major planning started. Well, so going going back to the cover crop. Um, 
conversation, Rebecca's asking Phil if you've noticed any differences in vine health or wine quality since you went to permanent cover crop in, in um, parts of your vineyard. I, I think the vine quality or the wine quality has improved, but I'm, I can't quantify that to say that it's, it's from the permanent cover crop or if it's from the, the vineyard aging. Right. Do you, have you seen anything though, like grape morphology or like smaller berries or anything obvious like that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. As, and there again, not knowing if it's the age of the vineyard or whatnot, but the bunches have definitely come down smaller uh, and the bear, the berries are smaller. I can, you know, a lot of years I can hold the bunches in my hand um, and they're not as big as they used to be. And uh, I definitely think that helps our wine quality. Great. So let's go ahead and look at this fourth line. And so if we could pull up the map, Jenny, um, we're going to turn to um, Kevin with the ink block Petit Verdot. And so Kevin, my recollection is this, this is the first wine um, that actually comes from multiple vineyards, but especially from the Borden Ranch area, which again is one of the younger growing regions of um, Lodi, relatively speaking. Again, historically, you can see Jenny's highlighting the, air, the section of Borden Ranch that the, um, that the vineyard can be found in. Again, historically, vines were initially planted in uh, the McCallamy River AVA. And, and as Aaron was getting at earlier, as you start to go north and east, things get a lot more rolling and hilly. And so, and the, the soils change significantly. And um, so Jenny, forgive me for jumping so far ahead on the slides, but we do have a soil slide for Borden Ranch and you can see how incredibly different it is from, from the other two um, areas that we've looked at. And so immediately notice there's, there's a lot more rocks involved and um, the soils kind of bunch up a little bit. Kevin, you want to tell us more about that? Sure, so Borden Ranch, um... Yeah, as you said, it is a, a one of the younger Appalachians or sub Appalachians of Lodi, and it's uh, it's uh, it's it's kind of famous for its uh, red red gravelly uh, red gravelly clay soils. And so this is uh, you know this is a very uh, a very good depiction of what those soils look like. A lot of Borden Ranch looks like this. Um, the site where the majority of uh, uh, where the majority of this wine comes from, which is uh, which is farmed by uh, by uh, by John Wetmore, um, is, is no different. And it's a it's a very gravelly clay uh, gravelly clay uh, location. Um, it, it dry creek rolls right through this uh, uh, right through this actual vineyard. So uh, that's just a funny little tidbit. So we do estimations every year on our vineyards and everything. This particular vineyard. It's got about I don't know ten different little islands throughout the uh, throughout the entire block because uh, Dry Creek rolls right through this, and so I mean we literally had to count uh, vine by vine to get a to get a, a, a vine count of what the actual acres are in this vineyard because you know Google Maps just means nothing when it mm -hmm. comes to a site like this, mm -hmm. and. Our estimations for years were just all over the board when it came to this uh, specific block. But one of my favorite uh, Petit Verdot uh, uh, blocks that uh, that we utilize, it consistently, you know, it consistently rises to the top um, of all the different uh, Petit Verdot that we uh, we process. Um, Whitmar's uh, uh, and his uh, nephew John Shin, or uh, Aaron Shin, great um, great farmers do a really good job on this block and if you've ever hung out with the Wetmores they're uh, they're very fun people so uh, <laughs> if you get a chance to uh, to uh, to hang out with them uh, I would say please uh, please take them up on it. Well and Aaron is so dang charming too. Oh it's uh, it's it's in his blood uh, you know as uh, as uh, you know, the multi generational farmers of Lodi, yeah, uh, as much as anybody. I mean, it's it, it runs deep there. Well, and building on Phil's point about vigor, I know when we were speaking about this particular wine, you were saying one of the things you really appreciate about this site is that that rockiness and slightly more challenging growing conditions you feel like really helps increase the quality and character of the Petit Verdot. Uh, Petit Verdot, in my opinion, it's a, uh, it's a very difficult variety to grow. It really just wants to grow. And so trying to, 
trying to maintain, uh, you know, or keep a damper on that vegetative quality is it's it's extremely different difficult. You know, when we, some of the blocks we work with on the west side, I mean, literally, I don't even want to touch them until you know year 12 year 15 because they're just go 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 whereas they can uh you know i mean this is a pretty old block this block is uh planted in 99 but you know over in some of these uh you know much more uh you know much much less bigger soils uh like board and ranch they do it does seem to have to struggle a little bit more it just naturally pulls back that uh that uh vigor that is inherent with the variety and it you know and it makes these wines that are uh they're just big chewy you know tannic uh you know inky wines that uh you know which is you know something that uh you know good petit verdots are, are are known for well and i love to though you know uh, we should point out there's um 19 petite syrah in this particular wine and i i love that you've done that with this blend just because Petit Verdot, in my mind, it's like the wine you get lost in. It's all dark. Your batteries have died. Your headlamp is not working. And you are, you're like in the cave with the Petit Verdot, you know? <laughs> and, um, but then the Petit Syrah just like, boom, just kind of brightens up and, and pulls open the mid palette here. And so you get this wonderful combination of that kind of like lightly tactile tannin. Um, but then with, uh, you know, kind of this juicy chewy um bright fruit mid palate and then and then that focus and tension of the petite verdot through a really long finish you know and so it's just it's a nice combination and it's a good you know the first three wines again were single vineyard single variety and this wine is a, it's a great example to bring in to get get at the power of blending vineyards and blending varieties too you know there's a reason why blends are done in in so many of the historic regions of the world this really gets at that um, one of the things though that we need to be sure to talk about is, you know, Lodi Rules has, um, again, you know, I was talking about how it's like a comprehensive toolkit. And so one of the key things to understand about this particular um, a sustainability certification program is that it actually focuses on six pillars or six chapters, each of which must, must be addressed by growers that are participating in the program. And so those, um, uh, you know, as we start, as we mentioned, it started as a pest management program. And so that's definitely one of the key um, pillars of the program. Um, soil and water we've mentioned. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a raven outside and my bird is, uh, can see it through the window. So she's freaking out, trying to warn me that the raven might get us. So, in case, so forgive her in the background. But so yeah, pest management, soil and water are three of the key pillars of Lodi rules, but then we also um, bring in uh, the business plan must be looked at because again, sustainability must be economically feasible. And then human resources um, are an important part of the program because again, the health of the people in the community are crucial. And then the holistic ecosystem as well. And um, Kevin, one of the things that you talked about that really stood out to me is how your experience was that in joining Lodi Rules and having to really fill out each of these six chapters, suddenly you had to have a record that you were accountable to as a farmer. And so you were having to pay more closer attention to how you were actually farming the vineyards. But then it also gave you, one of the other crucial things I took from our conversation was just how it also gave you a historical record so that if you started to see weird anomalies either in the vineyards or in the wine, you actually had a document to go back to to um, to try to investigate and find out what was going on. Could you tell us a little more about that? Uh, sure. I mean, this dives kind of into the the timeline of how Lodi rules evolved for Michael David. I mean, I believe the first year we started uh, we started using the program was in 2007, and that was just uh, on some of our own vineyards. And I mean, even back then, I was a uh, you know. Uh, confidence was never, uh, you know, something I was lacking and it's just gotten worse. <laughs> but, uh, uh, after, uh, <laughs> after, uh, a year in the program, I mean, I realized, uh, that this, this program was making me a better farmer and it's because I was, I was looking at farming in a little bit of a different way. And I was looking at a big picture approach 
and taking trying to take all of these different aspects of farming and uh, you know compile them into a single in a single growing year and then doing that across the board on all of our different vineyards and after that first year I was like wow this is this was this is such a great program and it allowed me um, it made me go wow I would sure like my other growers to do that so the next year we offered a voluntary bonus uh, to growers if they wanted to join the program and it, uh, you know, we gave them a seven and a half percent bump basically on, you know, on their, uh, on their great price. And so I got about 75% participation from the growers with just that monetary incentive. And with the, with the 85% component to be able to use the, uh, to be able to use the seal, it was like, well, if we're going to do this, we've, we've got to go all the way. And so in 09, it became a, uh, it became a mandated uh, aspect for Michael David growers to be part of the program. But what, uh, I guess what's unique for us is this was never thought of as a marketing program for me. This is a, uh, this is a vineyard. This is a quality management tool. And so Michael David, we keep every single lot of wine we make separate. So no grapes, uh, they don't get blended uh, when they come into the winery for processing. Every single grower, they go into their own tank. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're fermented uh, separately. They're kept separate throughout the whole process. And we don't do the, we don't start blending those wines uh, together until we're, you know, we're getting them ready to make our bottle ready wines. And so how that really ties in with the Lodi rules for us is we have these, this consistent base of growers that we work with year in, year out. And we're tracking these wines year in and year out. And the Lodi rules really helps us do that because it gives us this giant, you know, this giant playbook, uh, you, you know, every year of what's going on in the vineyards. And so we could start seeing similarities of different growing years, seeing differences of growing years, and we can start tying that to some of the practices. And it allows us to tweak the, the farming practices that may be happening in, every, in any given year based on the circumstances of that growing season. And it therefore becomes a very, very useful tool for us in helping to maintain uh, consistency, of, uh, consistency of product. And so for us, this is just, it's a big uh, grape growing and winemaking tool for consistency of, just for consistency of our brand, consistency of our product, consistency of our wines. Well, I love that point too, that you, it gives you a way to really look back over time, you know, and um, um, Madeline, when, you know, you help a lot of growers kind of enter the program because you know it is six chapters um, or six pillars that need to be addressed and again it's about documenting um, your practices like Kevin was just describing but you know one of the things we talked about is how yes it's challenging to get all that documentation and sometimes you know if you if you're used to just going out and being in the vineyard and just getting it done now you suddenly have to shift gears and like actually document and record it and so that initial start can be challenging but I know one of the things that you pointed out was that once you've done it, you just maintain it and it's easier at that point. But can you tell us just a little bit more about that kind of entry process, you know, really learning the six pillars and and, um, and getting that started as a grower? Uh, absolutely. Like you said, I find again and again when growers, especially from wineries like Michael David, who have that requirement, they'll reach out for help. I find again and again, the growers intimately know these practices. You wouldn't be in farming if you weren't already committed to sustainability. Farming in itself just encourages a longevity. You're not going to invest your whole livelihood into the land and your, and your livelihood without committing to keeping all the peas healthy, the people and the place and the prosperity. So that's not the challenge. It's not encouraging them to change their practices. The challenge is like Kevin said, how do you document it so that you have that as a reference for the future and you have it for your audit through the third party certification process. That takes a little bit of effort the first year to get them set up, farmers, to get them set up to have a binder and have a system on how they're gonna hold themselves accountable to these farming practices. 
but they're already doing so much of it. I just find it a pleasure to meet these new growers who have committed to getting certified because it's not twisting arms. It's more following up with paperwork and documentation on how to execute. Right. Well, and Aaron, you know, as we've said, you've you've helped evolve different iterations of the program. And, you know, when it got started in 1992, um, um, it was really based on the needs of growers. Um, so which I think really speaks to that practical toolkit aspect of this particular program. It's really been built um, with researchers um, based on on best science at the time. So we keep evolving the iterations to keep up to date with that science. Um, Steve Mathiason actually um, was one of the people that helped create, he was the co-writer uh, that created the very original iteration of the notebook and, or the wine growers workbook. And then Aaron, you came in with the second iteration of it. And, um, and you know, I was hoping you could just speak again to that process, you know, like Madeline was just describing, uh, you know, she was pointing out if you're, if you're farming, you're already thinking in terms of sustainability. I think it's important to emphasize the, the vast, vast majority of growers in Lodi are family owned family farms and, and the wineries in Lodi for the most part, again, family owned. And that I think really gets at Madeline's point about, you know, if this is your family's investment, then you need it to last for the long run. And that's going to really motivate you farming in this way. But other comments you want to make about kind of that, that process of getting to know your site through getting to know this, this program and the documentation process with it. There's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, <laughs> but first off, I just want to kind of dispel this, this myth out there that just because you're a five, fifth generation family that automatically makes you an amazing farmer and a great wine grape grower, because I think that there are plenty of uh, uh, people out there with a long legacy that are still hanging on to the ways that their great grandfather did um, and not evolving and self-assessing to do, uh, to employ the newest and greatest um, farm management practices. And I'm not saying that um, the way my grandfather did it was wrong. We can learn a lot from the experience and the wisdom that uh, that came from every farmer before us. But I think that uh, the Lodi rules encourages a constant uh, in the self-assessment workbook, right? A constant assessment of your practices in a very methodical way where you can look to how am I handling my soil management and I rate myself at a level two. I've got two more steps to go. It provides that roadmap for us to look at where we are now, what our goals are in, you know, going forward to help achieve that. To, because sustain, you know, being a sustainable farmer or using sustainable vineyard practices is not it, not, not to use this cliched, uh, you know, uh, saying, but it's it's about the journey, not the destination. You know, you're never there. You're never going to be there. And so I think that the folks who are resting on their laurels, um, uh, farming the exact same way that uh, their ancestors did, um, you know, could be not saying they are, but could be missing out on how they can improve. Because I think that for us to be really great wine grape growers, we need to be uh, looking inward at ourselves, looking at how uh, our environment is changing around us and reacting to that. And I think that the, uh, the, the sustainability workbooks that the Lodi Wine Group Commission has, uh, has produced um, helps provide that roadmap and that template to, uh, to help us improve constantly and consistently. Well, that point that we started with just that we're talking about farming with a long-term vision in a range of conditions. One of the conditions that changes over time is our knowledge of best practices and our understanding of the environment that we're in as well. And, and our technology also changes, right? So for our vision to evolve, our understanding of each of those things must also evolve. So of course, we yeah, need to I farm differently than our grandparents. Well, and, well, in some cases, yes, but in some cases, uh, they knew exactly what they're doing. You know, we, we had a period in the, in the uh, 1990s where everyone and their mother was planting in Lodi, or a lot of people were planting uh, very strict, very tight VSP systems, uh, which didn't allow, which allowed for too much fruit exposure. And we ended up, uh, you know, going away from that in the late 2000s and now, because we're realizing that that was probably a mistake. Um, and so I think that um, uh, just because it's, it was done a long time ago doesn't mean that it was right or wrong, but it's certainly uh, everything we do here deserves close attention. And I think it's also, uh, you, know, um, I, you know, to your point about knowledge, you know, I, I also heard another uh, uh, quote the other day, I don't know who said it, but he said something like, as my, my island of knowledge uh, grows bigger, so does my shoreline of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And I think that is 
uh, very telling on what it feels like to be a farmer, because the more you learn and understand, uh, the more you realize how much out there that you don't understand. There's a whole galaxy of factors that uh, affect us in growing every year, and every year is different. And uh, so it, it makes it an extremely, extremely challenging uh, profession to be in. Yeah, that's great. So Aaron, let's go ahead and, and stick with you. And then I want to come back to, um, to that question of, um, actually, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to switch that. Kevin, you know, you were talking about when, once you joined Lodi Rules and started to realize how useful it was for you, you know, Michael David actually offered a premium to growers to join. And then at, initially on a voluntary basis, but then um, it became a requirement. Um, and so I think though that point, like sometimes people think, oh my gosh, there's all this extra documentation. Is it worth the time? Surely that changes your cost structure because you have to put that time in. But, you know, it really should be noted, Michael David help, really helped motivate joining Lodi Rules in the region because, by offering that that motivation and the premium and then the requirement, you know? So any other comments just on that, just on that point? Um, well, I mean, as much as we all love doing what we do and everybody here, I think is a, is a very strong testament to uh, being committed to, uh, to this, uh, this world, this lifestyle, you know, what we do here in Lodi. I mean, this, it, it, has, it has to be economically sustainable. Not sometimes gets lost, that message sometimes gets lost in the mix. And after doing, you know, after that initial year of uh, the program where we, uh, where I did it myself, I realized it's, you know, this is a great program and it has, there's so many aspects that um, help me as a farmer, but it's not easy. I mean, this is, this is a difficult process. It's, uh, it's time consuming, it's burdensome. And so to mandate that on growers without any kind of compensation, I found was, um, it's just, it was, it was, it was the opposite of what I wanted to convey and what I want my, for my growers. You know, you got to kind of put your money where your mouth is. And so it made it a very easy decision to say to, you know, to meet with the family and say, this is a great program. I think this is going to be a very strong tool in our toolbox, but we have to, we have to compensate growers for this effort. And we can't just, we can't just mandate this without, without making this, uh, you know, uh, giving something back. Yeah. I think it really points at this point too, though, that as, as consumers and buyers, but whether in restaurants or retail communicate to wineries, look, we really want to support uh, certified sustainability programs. And again, let's remember sustainability programs in general have the same goal, but they have different ways of helping to deliver that. Right. And, and uh, so, but as we, as consumers and buyers, let wineries and wine regions know we care about these things, then, you know, Kevin with Michael Dave and the winery side can then motivate the growers to care about these things too. And I think that that kind of that chain of influence is really important to acknowledge here. Um, so again, I, I want to repeat this. There's six pillars. We've talked a little bit just now about the business side, um, the human resources side. Phil helped us talk through a little bit on the soil and water side. Um, again, the program got started initially as a pest management tool, but one of the things that I want to take a minute to also talk about is the point that the sixth pillar is the ecosystem or holistic environment, because again, the thing that I think has really shifted in the last 10 or so years in farming across um, around the world, but especially in California is recognizing that a vineyard never stands alone. That, a vin that it's farming, best practices for farming is never only about the vines. Um, it has to also be about the soil, it has to also be about the water, it has to also be about the people and the business plan, but, um, but it also has to be about the habitat that surrounds the, the vineyard. And Aaron, one of the, um, you are charming by the way, um, just, just so you know, um, but so go ahead and take yourself off mute because one of the things that I love is you, you and your son have actually created a website that is just looking at wildlife in Lodi that's been seen through the different vineyards that your family farms, which is so cool. But it really, um, it's a fantastic website. It's super fun to, to look at. It's kind of, um, you know, this work that your son has put together. There's, there's videos of different animals and kind of little tidbits of information about them. 
But the, um, it really points to that idea of preserving wildlife corridors and wildlife habitat in the vineyards. And um, your family, and even long before joining a program like Lodi Rules, your family was really invested in doing habitat restoration work and has for generations now. And so Jenny, I was hoping we could pull up this photo. Um, I got to spend a day uh, driving around different sites um, that Lang Twins farms and in the midst of it, we were like going along the McCallum River and looking at how they've kind of helped reinvigorate the river edges. And then we came around the corner and out of nowhere, there was this incredible pond and there, there was a huge range of um, wildlife birds and toads and, um, and different furry four-legged animals as well. Um, it's just this like idyllic little area in the middle of Lodi and it like people don't even know it's there. One of the things you know I, I admire about this is like I have to I have to point out Lang Twins has done an, a lot of work on habitat restoration and is not going around advertising it. Like the point is not to be famous for habitat restoration. But I asked Aaron if we could go ahead and um, and talk about it anyway because I think it's really important. One is an illustration of again this pillar of Lodi rules, but also like that local commitment, that long term vision. Like this is, this is a really gorgeous creek pond wildlife area. Um, and only a few decades ago, this area, my understanding is that this area was dry, but that you've helped restore it. Yeah, well, I find the irony of it pretty funny because as the moment you were saying, you guys don't ask any credit for it. I'm, I'm like literally plugging in my son's website, you know, here, check this out. Yeah, but um, that's different. That's your son, <laughs> you know? I know. Like, we should promote our kids' work. We should. Well, the the that whole thing kind of came about because my son, who's nine years old, or going to be nine, it was he's very outdoorsy and um, was just, he's with this pandemic uh, Zoom schooling BS, it was just unbelievable uh, how, how tied in they were to screen. So this was a way for him to get outside. So he places a game cameras, little motion sensor game cameras all over the vineyard and in different habitat projects that we have done in the Jayhant Slough watershed. Um, and then we basically post, you know, the animals that we find, the native flora and fauna in our area. And so it's really based towards little kids. It's not based towards adults, but it's fun to explore. So, and it's fun for him to do that because he researches the animals and then, um, uh, and then uh, posts about them. But I think that's really important that, that we talk to our kids and we talk to um, well, to everyone about what our relationship should be with the land and with our fellow flora and fauna, right? I mean, we're taught in school about how to treat other people, you know, the golden rule, treat those how you want to be treated. We, we talk about how we should live in a society. We have governing laws and democracy, but we're never really taught. And this is a, a thought that I think Aldo Leopold came up with, like the father of conservation and, and conservationalists in, in the U.S. Um, you know, we're never really taught about what is our relationship with the land? And that's one thing that I'm really trying to instill in my kids is to have a relationship with the land, to understand uh, that we are stewards of this land for a period of time uh, and that it needs to be respected and we work with it. And that's the same thing with vineyards, right? Uh, the vines have to be a participant in the larger ecosystem. Um, and one of the things that we've gone away from how my grandfather planted uh, wine grapes is that he would, you know, it was basically a moonscape. He was a very square headed, headed German. He wanted everything just so. And, um, you know, he didn't allow for anything else to grow near or, or around his vineyards. And that's changed completely. You know, we are now doing, uh, trying to make our corners of, of our vineyards uh, come alive with uh, native uh, flora and fauna. So we're planting native California drought resistant plants um, that are native to this area in our riparian zones to try to really provide corridors for other animals, especially uh, well, vertebrates, some vertebrates, uh, but mainly they're insectaries as well. So they're really attracting uh, pollinators and other um, insects and butterflies and the whole, uh, the whole um, uh, spectrum in order to try to bring that biodiversity back into our, into our area. You know, we farming in itself is, um, can be absolutely seen as, you know, we, we took all the wild plants that are out there and we cultivated over time. And now we have these large 
uh, agricultural systems, which by its very nature reduces biodiversity, right? That's what it does. But the benefit we get from that is a more consistent food source that we can depend on and feed our world. Um, but there's also, you know, negatives to that by decreasing that biodiversity. But I think we as farmers, if we see our, our farming as a uh, participant in a larger ecosystem, I think we can bring that biodiversity back. And just with a little bit of uh, research and knowledge and, and elbow grease, we can uh, do some amazing things in our vineyard to uh, to help our overall ecosystem and um, and make our vines a participant in that. Well, and, and Lang Twins has been part of doing, you alluded to it a minute ago, but education for local high schools as well. Could you briefly comment on that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, we're very proud to be a part of the, uh, the Center for Land-Based Learning's um, a SLUS program, it's called. Uh, it's an organization based out of winter, and they uh, work with local high schools who, um, who bring a whole class out once a year, sorry, three times a year during a Habitat project. And they'll actually bring, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds out. I guess they're about 15, 16 to you know, look at, uh, you know, a far, an edge of a vineyard that is not doing anything. It's just turning radius for attractors. It's a little corner that we couldn't uh, use for production. And let's put a Habitat project there. And so they come out, they learn about the native species, they learn about what it takes to plant the plants, irrigate them, what ecosystem benefits those plants are going to provide for our, uh, for the soil, for the biodiversity in our area. Um, so it's a real learning opportunity for kids who, you know, it's sad to say, but there are a certain sector of, of adults and kids out there who think that food comes from Safeway, right? Um, and there's that connection back to the land does not exist. And so for us, it's about uh, education and having them understand where their food comes from and how important the preservation of our uh, natural resources are. Um, because you know these are the these kids are going to be voting in two or three years. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that they understand um, uh, how important farming is to the uh, to the security of our nation um, and um, and to the benefit of our communities. Yeah, because we can only make an inform we can only make a smart decision if it's an informed decision. And that really plays into voting like you're talking about. And so I love that you're doing this additional work to really help educate kids so they know what they're growing into, so to speak. But, you know, Kevin, I know that um, one of the things that you talked about le really learning from the Lodi Rules program was the idea that you could do pest management through something as simple as putting owl boxes in the vineyard. But then that's turned into an educational opportunity with, with schools in the area, too. Could you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done with um, schools coming out to some of the sites for Michael David? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, Outbox is, that was one of those, uh, that was one of those uh, aspects that, that surprised me a little bit when we uh, started the Lodi Rules Pro started to uh, join the Lodi Rules Program was Outboxes were part of the, you know, part of the sustainability process and, you know, put up a, put up one in, you know, each of the vineyards. And I was shocked within how quick those owl boxes became populated, um, habitated by owls. And then <laughs> when you look below the owl box and you see the pile of vermin destruction, <laughs> it just blows your mind. And you realize these beautiful creatures are working for me and they're doing it by just providing them a house. And so we took that aspect and it was like, now it's like, way way more than a uh, you know is needed for the program but it's like we would put i don't know on average one box per five acres now in our in our vineyards and it's still those things get habitated so quickly and these things these owls are doing so much work for you in the vineyards it's just it's a very cool um it's a very cool aspect uh, you know one minute part, part of the program but we've had different classes come out and they're actually you know they're actually taking the owl scat, I think that's the word, and uh, they're dissecting it and they're seeing the different, um, you can literally pick apart the different critters that these owls are, uh, that these owls are uh, preying on. You know, the gophers, voles, occasionally ground squirrels. I mean, the, the owls are voracious and they are, they are definitely leaving proof. I mean, I'm gonna call it the owl timesheet. They, they leave proof right there of what they're uh, what they're doing and it's uh, it's such a easy aspect to uh, to show kids because you can you know takes nothing and they can start identifying oh look at that's a that's a mouse skull that's a gopher skull that's a vole skull you know and um, 
it's a it's a, it's a very uh, easy direct uh, direct way to convey what is happening in this uh, this particular part of the uh, ecosystem with the owls and the uh, uh, the owls and the vineyards. I love though too how it's such a great example of the holistic point, the point of the holistic farming. You know, the truth is that voles and gophers really easily kill vines either by eating the roots or by girding the vine, beating a ring around them. It's a huge problem. And, you know, historically people would poison the, um, the voles or the gophers. But the problem with that is that you, you then kill off your pest, but actually raptors of all different sorts go and eat the um, gophers or voles and, and the poison that they just ingested kills them too. And so instead, as uh, Madeline was just typing into comments, by increasing the potential habitat for different types of raptors by either having perches for hawks or even golden eagles uh, can be found in this area, or actually putting owl boxes, then suddenly you get natural pest control. Then, um, you know, smaller bird boxes help with different um, winged insects as well, which is really important because the insects, um, certain types of insects can be vectors for virus that can impact um, vines. So like, again, the greater biodiversity, um, as as Malin was talking about, that we can bring into the vineyard, the better. And I, but I love too how Aaron and Kevin were just making the point that we can think of a, our holistic farming practices as literally farming for more than just the vines, farming for the surroundings, but also notice how that can then become part of um, bringing the community into thinking about farming too, which is so beautiful. So as we're starting to finish up, I wanna point out that Lodi Rules actually currently has 55,000 acres of vines, uh, vineyards certified, um, 1,292 vineyards certified. And really importantly, um, these, these certified areas are not only in Lodi. Jenny, if we could pull up the, um, the slide that has the different um, decal images. Again, remember, on the back of your bottle, your wine bottle, you could find any one of these um, logos, which all imply that th that wine has 85% or more certified grapes under the Lodi Rules program. So within Lodi, the program is called Lodi Rules. Lodi Rules though certifies vineyards from more than just the um, crush district that, falls, uh, that Lodi falls within. So you'll notice that some of these decals say California Rules. Um, but actually, this program certifies vineyards up the entire West Coast. Um, there's quite a few spots in Washington uh, that have fully adopted this program. And then you'll also notice uh, rules for sustainable wine growing um, is the, the other way that you might see this decal. So notice visually, they all look very similar. But depending on where you're located, the wording could be slightly different. Rules for sustainable wine growing includes um, vineyards outside California, but also outside the United States. And so Madeline, I was hoping that you could briefly comment on that. Lodi Rules has extended beyond Lodi. It actually certifies um, vineyards uh, in multiple parts of the world. And as I said, it has become the inspiration for other newer sustainability programs as well. Lodi Rules um, and the Wine Growers Workbook really was, again, um, you know, Lodi is is very humble and says only says that's the first in the United States, but in actuality is the first um, sustainability program in the world that has gone on to inspire programs all over the world as well. But it literally also does um, currently certify vineyards around the United States and around the world. And so Madeline, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, we are consistently flattered by so many people coming to us and asking how they can be a part of our program because it is so rigorous and it is so scientific, but at the same time, it's so easy to accomplish if you make that commitment. So one example is a, a group from the Golan Heights in Israel came to our program and asked, hey, is there any way that you could make this program adaptable for us to use? We like where it's coming from. We like looking at the six different chapters. This would work well for us. Um, so our family traveled there two years ago. Let's just round it off to two years ago. Yeah. And uh, we made it a everything point- Everything was two years ago. Everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we made a point of going to the Golan Heights and meeting with the winemaker who um, had time that he spent visiting vineyards in Lodi before he moved to Israel. He, he worked for Wilbur Ellis. He was a vineyard uh, site um, 
checker and he knew all about our area. So it was even a better tie in for us. But here we are with a reputable winery from international sources that wanted to be a part of it. So we went and, and toured vineyards and you can just see how the program is flexible enough to be used worldwide. You just have to be mindful, like you said, of your place. You have to look at your priorities and see how the program is gonna help you make choices to keep that sustainability in mind. And we tasted through the wines and they make it a big part of their story when they taste the wines of how they're certified sustainable. And they talk about the Lodi Rules program. So that made me proud to know that we're a part of something that's working, not just for our area, not for outside our Chris district, not just for the United States, but is applicable internationally. Right, because again, we're farming with long-term vision for differing conditions. You know, that's, that's really, sustainability is about bringing together people, place, and prosperity with that long-term vision um, that, you know, can be flexible for different growing conditions and circumstances. And so that's, that's what I really admire about the Lodi Rules program is that it's offering a toolkit so growers can make their own best decisions for themselves based on the situation that they're in. And um, so, uh, Kevin, one of the questions that came in, though, was just um, just quickly, does Michael, David, have any plans to make 100% Petit Verdot? We have, uh, so there's a specific line of Michael David that's actually the Michael David brand. I mean, if you know my winery or my family's winery, there's multiple brands under that umbrella. But there's a specific Michael David brand that is all, um, those are all uh, either state vineyards, uh, vineyard designated or or uh, outside grower vineyards, uh, vineyard designated. And so we we do have a, we do have it on the agenda to make a, a 100% Petit Verdot you know, eventually, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's a small, there's a small market for those wines and it's uh, mostly uh, filtered for through direct, uh, direct to consumer at our, uh, at the store or via our wine club. But uh, I know we are planning on, I've, I've seen it on our list at least of uh, planning to do a direct uh, a pure Petit Verdot down the road here. That's great. And Phil, a question for you. Do you have any plans to expand your Rhone program either with other reds or perhaps a, bringing in a white? Um, we did just plant a couple rows, not a lot, of, um, of Moved and uh, Movedre and uh, Cinso. So we're kind of looking forward to play with that a little bit. Not a lot, but it's just something I've always wanted to have and play around with. Whites, um, we almost, when when the growing, a couple of years ago, we were having a hard time finding contracts. Dad had a field that we were thinking about grafting over. We have contracts for it now. So I don't know if we'll ever get into whites, uh, not anytime soon. Uh, I do love them. I, I, you know, the Rhone ones, especially, uh, I, I've really enjoyed, but uh, not not in the immediate future. Okay, great. Okay, so as we finish up, I'd love to hear from each of you something happening in Lodi that people might not be aware of that you're really excited about. Madeline, do you want to start? Well, as a mom to three kids, I have to plug the hard work that our director, Stephanie Bolton, put in to make our Lodi bingo cards. <laughs> she got this fantastic bingo card out for Earth Day. Um, and it, on one side, it has, there's six different versions, so you can play with the family, but just has the tenements of things to look for, like biodiversity or um, owls or just a whole host of things um, to educate our youth. I think that sometimes it's hard to tell that story to our kids, the more and more that we can have them embrace why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and through a tool like this is fantastic. And she included pencils that in the, um, the, the end of the pencil has seeds that are plantable. So if anyone's interested, we have plenty of those at, at the Wine Grape Commission and would lo love to share that story to educate the youth. That's great. Aaron, something else. So exciting about? thing happening in Lodi is um, in the field. Uh, using pheromone mating disruption. So just really quickly on that, you know, instead of using a, um, a chemical material in order to control 
uh, vine mealybug, which is one of the most um, uh, resilient pests that we have that will actually spread uh, virus from one mm -hmm. vine to another. Uh, we are deploying a kind of a neighborhood effort here of about 3,200 acres of, and uh, the Phillips family are part of that, um, of pheromone mating disruption. So that means we actually put a little dispenser out in the field that looks like a business card uh, where it, it emits a smell, basically a perfume, a pheromone that confuses the male mealybugs and it makes them think that there are females all around them. And, and thus they cannot find the female they're looking for because they're confused. And so that prevents them from mating and reproducing and reduces that population naturally. So we're really hoping to use pheromone mating disruption and find great success on a neighborhood scale, which is going to, going to reduce our dependency on uh, other control methods going forward. So we're very excited about that program this year. Yeah, I love that program. You know, just the point that reducing sprays um, or or active poison type um, treatments and instead just using this little card that doesn't impact the vine or environment at all. It just impacts the pest directly. It's so, so valuable. And it's really been, um, uh, Lodi has been helping to lead the charge on getting to know how this, this type of um, initiative can work. And, you know, Aaron, I know you've been doing a lot to help motivate other growers. Um, and Michael David has been part of that as well. And, and cause again, it's that community effort, everybody joining it is what's gonna make it effective. But to be honest though, working with Kevin's been difficult but his head vineyard manager has been excellent and really helpful in this effort. Well, that confidence problem that Kevin has, you know, it's, you know, yeah. we're, we're all put up with it as well yeah. as we can. Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so having, having, set that up. Uh, Kevin, do you, do you want to talk about what you're excited about? Or should I give you a moment to recover your cool before, before you hear from me? <laughs> I'm in for it now. <laughs> well, I got to say, I'm pretty sure my wife's bought into this mating disruption program. She's got this stuff hanging up all over our room. <laughs> she said three kids is enough. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks, Aaron. No problem, bud. Um. Anything you're excited about in Lodi, though? <laughs> the uh, well, I'm excited because school's about to end, and uh, um, my uh, my lovely wife Lori, who is a uh, a touch of a helicopter parent, has uh, has finally given me the permission to take my oldest daughter Lainey, who uh, was just recently 12, to uh, take her paddling down the McCallumy River, oh, which awesome. is something I do regularly, and I. I love the McCallumy. I go, I get on there and it's, it's like taking me into a whole new world, right? You know, it's just, you have no idea that you're, you know, occasionally you're in the middle of the city I mean, where you're going through here, but you know, it's, it's not a real traveled river. There's lots of uh, nooks and snags and all sorts of strainers we call them. But uh, my wife gave me the permission to take Laney. So school's about to get out and I get to start uh, paddling the, uh, the river with my, uh, with my oldest daughter. That's so fun. It's so pretty too. What a, what a cool thing to do for the summer. Okay, Phil, take us home. What are you excited about in Lodi right now? Um, I just have a comment to make about uh, the structure of Lodi wineries uh, that are out there. Um, most of them, I think, are rooted with uh, families that have started in the, the farming end of things. They've either self-taught themselves as winemakers and then they've started these wineries and been very successful and it produced some amazing wines out there. And, and I just started thinking about it the other day, all of these wineries, and I can't hardly think of too many wineries where it was winemaker driven and then they were buying fruit. And I think that's unusual for most areas. Um, so I just want to put a shout out to that. I mean, these three panelists with me, they, that's how they have been doing things. They start out in the farming, and then they got into the wine industry and they're making fabulous wines. And you can just keep naming them off. I mean, it just goes on and on. McKay, you know, Mettler, Klinkerbrit, you know, and, and you can go on and on. So I find that amazing. And I wanna say thank you to those wineries that are doing a fantastic job of moving Lodi forward, putting Lodi on the label and selling those wines, helping our area. That's great, thank you. So I'd like to, 
um, make a point of thanking Dr. Stephanie Bolton. She's been here in the background answering questions with great detail. And, um, and she really, as Madeline mentioned, we really need to thank her for doing such an incredible job helping to communicate about Lodi Rules, really making it easier to do some of that community outreach um, and, and fun education, as Madeline mentioned. But also she's done a an incredible amount of work helping to growers better understand different ways to implement aspects of that toolkit that we've been talking about and really just done an amazing job for Lodi. So I really wanna make a point of giving a shout out to her. Huge thanks to, um, to Katie and Jenny um, for behind the scenes and, and running the slides, um, helping get us all uh, wrangled and in order to um, actually pull this webinar off. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done there. And um, huge thanks for to Stuart for um, sponsoring this and deciding that we should um, go ahead and do a webinar like this. Farming is something that I do not do personally, but is something I'm really passionate about. As many of you know, I grew up commercial fishing for salmon in Alaska. I got started at the age of nine and it's, um, the only reason I mention that is because I think it makes me especially sympathetic to the kind of lifestyle and, and family oriented farming that, that I find in Lodi and the way that so many of these people that we've heard from today and so many more that we could mention, like Phil was alluding to, really all got started at a young age like that and really hands-on, on the ground, um, active, um, growing um, as, a, as a family commitment and a lifestyle. And I really, I have a lot of respect for that. And then huge thanks to Lynn and to Psalm Foundation for helping to make this happen, for helping to implement the quiz. Again, um, if you are registered for the webinar, you will get an email inviting you to participate in the quiz. Um, as long as you do not work for the Wine Grape Commission, then you are eligible for the scholarship as well. And I don't know if Lynn wants to pop back on and give us any other last reminders in relation to that or in relation to to um, the scholarship and, and what Psalm Foundation is doing. Um, I'm not sure if she has any other last. Do you want to do any last, <laughs> any last reminders for us before we sign nope, off? Just, uh, we're going to send that email out. So all of you will get a link to the test. Um, and we will probably have it out by six o'clock Pacific tonight. If you don't receive it by, by then, check your spam filter and feel free to email me if you have any trouble accessing it. Uh, but you'll get the email this evening. And good luck. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you to everybody for joining us today. I hope you, um, I hope you learned more about farming and as well as about Lodi and Lodi rules. And we are also grateful for you being here today. Um, there will be a recorded session that I believe will be sent out um, later in the week to anybody that was registered as well. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to each of you panelists for giving us so much time and insight. It's, it's great. That's what makes this work. Bet. Back to work. <laughs>